Greetings. This is great. Welcome, everybody. I'm Kendra Preston Leonard. I'm delighted to introduce today's panelists to you and our inclusion and representation panel. As we go, please feel free to put questions and comments in the chat. If there's a specific question that you want us to answer at the end, I think we will use the Q&A box for that. It's a little bit easier. So you can find the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen along where it says things like chat and record and stuff like that. If you don't have that option on your Zoom screen, go ahead and put stuff into the chat bar on the side. All right, so I wanna introduce everybody. And after I do that, I'll ask them each to talk a little bit about themselves. We have a couple of pre-formatted questions to ask and talk about, and then we will get started on uh, audience questions and comments. So let me introduce to you Valerie Valdez. Valerie is there, yep, in the Ray Bradbury shirt in front of the beautiful golden and black screen, right? Ruth Nasrula, who will be familiar to a number of you. Okay, thank you, Ruth, for joining us on this. Tanya Adelit who is coming to us from, I don't know where you're coming to us from. So you can tell us in, in your own introduction, we'll get there. Arau Amenya, who just was my panel chair in the previous session, which was on memoir writing, and Anjali Anjati, um, who is down there at the, at the bottom of my screen. My screen probably doesn't look like everybody else's anyway. So panelists, I will ask you to talk a little bit about yourselves. Valerie, do you want to start off? Sure thing. <clears throat> so I'm the author of uh, two books so far, third one coming out. They are all found family space opera books, starting with Chilling Effect, so sci-fi writer here. And I'm also a Cuban American, cishet, and I have two kids and live in Georgia. I have also cats who are probably going to photobomb us at some point during the panel. One it's is trying to right call now. without cats. It's just not. We have to have the, the cats. Ruth, how about you? Yeah, hi, I am a uh, freelance journalist and that's the main, although I have an MFA in creative nonfiction, most of my work is in journalism and not literary work, um, in part because I have a long list of rejections from literary magazines. So I mean, there's a session I'm gonna be going to tomorrow. But uh, yeah, so my uh, beat originally was religion and now I've kind of moved away into nature and the environment and working on combining the two. And I'm looking forward to uh, today's discussion. Tanya, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Tanya Adelit. I'm Zooming in from San Antonio, but I usually live in Houston. Um, I am a Pakistani-American speculative fiction writer. Um, and really, spec fic was my home um, because I didn't find myself in the literary fiction that I was reading in school. Um, it was really hard to see my own experiences. And speculative fiction gave me a whole universe to explore instead. Um, so thanks so much. I'm really excited to, to dig into this conversation with y'all. Excellent. Arau, you're on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you all. I'm excited to be here. I'm glad to see Kendra again. Um, my name is Arau. Uh, thank you so much, Kendra, for pronouncing my name correctly. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm Ugandan born. Um, I'm based in Maryland. Um, I'm a poet and a writer. I'm from Lango, Northern Uganda. Um, so I definitely, I, I think it was Tanya, uh, immigrant kids, right? Uh, third, <laughs> third culture kid. So I, I resonate with that. Um, I'm a biography writer and editor at Poetry Foundation, publisher of Poetry Magazine. Um, I studied fiction writing at University of Baltimore. Um, I also have a journalism background as well as political science background. Um, my, I just started doing um, uh, creative writing recently. My background is in journalism. I have a lot of journalism work published um, and I've recently uh, finished my MFA in 2019. So I'm just uh, starting out writing creative writing, um, um, poetry, fiction, uh, playwriting, all of that good stuff. Um, so the rest of the stuff is in my bio. But right now I'm working on a book of poems, 53 poems dedicated to my mother who passed away from leukemia. And I'm also working on a um, short story collection. So I'm not sure when that all is gonna happen, but we're gonna make it happen. I'm so glad to be here. And again, I'm so glad to see, see Kendra. And Anjali, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, hi, 
Hi, I'm Anjali Jetty. I, like Valerie, live in Georgia. I live north of Atlanta. Um, I'm the author of two books, uh, Southbound Essays on Identity, Inheritance and Social Change, and the novel The Parted Earth. I also have a journalism background. I've always done it uh, as a freelance, and I teach in the MFA programs at Reinhardt University and Antioch. Um, I'm also an activist and an organizer, and, um, and so I've always had a particular interest in this topic um, because I feel that um, organizing and writing are two fields that really uh, inform each other and that um, they both have a lot of the same goals. Um, and, um, and so I'm super interested to talk with you all about this topic today. It's going to be a great discussion. My own background, I'm a poet, I am disabled, I have chronic illness, and I am autistic. I am still, um, I'm still waiting to see good representation <laughs> uh, in the things we write, but I will say that those of you who are doing a lot of speculative work, thank you, because that is often a place where I, I see that starting. Um, so, and, and my goal here is to help writers become more educated about writing about disability and autism and, and give people the support and information they need to understand what's going on, and especially in the current discourse about those things. So let's start off with what we mean when we talk about inclusivity and representation, because these are big terms. And the, the world of writing is one where I feel like people use these terms very differently, um, depending on genre or depending on audience. And so for me, I think it means that writers need to talk to the kinds of people they want to write about, you know, and more importantly, they need to listen to the people that they want to write about, right? Um, you know, I was, I was thinking of examples and I was thinking, you know, someone writing about a disabled college student needs to go talk to disabled college students, you know, or people who are recently out of school and ask them, what was your experience like, right? I mean, all too often, you know, I, I read things where um, the author has good intentions, but hasn't really done their homework if they're outside of the, the group that they are, are writing about, right? or that someone will say, I'm part of marginalized group A, therefore I can write about marginalized group B when it's not the same at all. So what does it mean to all of you when we, when we talk about inclusivity and representation? What kinds of things does that, does that bring up for all of you? And anyone can, can start. I'm gonna call on people. I'll, I'll start. There you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Around the I, okay, I, I just had such a great experience in the last panel discussion with Kendra. So I was like, yes, let, let me let me jump in. Um, when I read a story, it doesn't matter which genre it is. It could be poetry, it could be fiction, it could be nonfiction. When I feel seen and heard, um, you know, my background is um, even in Uganda, it was British. It was European and American white writers that I was exposed to. Um, even here in the US, um, I only got to read my first black author in college. Um, and, uh, you know, and of course, forget about Africans in <laughs> reading about people who are Africans or immigrants. So when I feel seen and I feel heard and I feel, you know, when I, um, I, I started reading Indian writers because I wanted to see you know, I wanted to under you know to know you know someone to, someone know what it feels like to grow up as an immigrant uh, immigrant teenager uh, in the U.S. Right. So when I feel seen and heard and validated and affirmed, um, I, I think that's what makes me gravitate to different genres. And it doesn't necessarily have to be from my background per se. Um, you know, if I'm reading an Indian writer who understands what it means to be an immigrant in the US, that clicks for me, you know? We don't necessarily have to share the same background. But when, when I just feel affirmed and heard and seen and visible, um, then that work means so much to me, whether it's um, uh, culture or race or, you know, ability, disability, whatever the case may be, um, just, just appearing on the page is so important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth, you were going to say something. 
Yeah, and actually, um, visibility was one of the things that I think is really key to representation is simply being seen and, uh, and also being recognized for who you are um, and, you know, what you represent. And I think that people getting it right also, and I have to confess to a big mistake I made that taught me a lesson, right? <laughs> I took, I know I took a poetry class with you, Kendra, but I took a 10 week long poetry class as well, poetry workshop. And so I decided to write about, you know, I was volunteering on the border. So I said, let me write about migrants on the border. So I write about a woman who's from a Latin American country in my voice, <laughs> you know, like I'm, I'm this woman. So I refer to the Rio Grande and the, the, the instructor says, it's the Rio Bravo. It's only called the Rio Grande north of the border. So that's an example of not <laughs> improper representation. When the opposite of that happens, then we have representation. And inclusivity, I think, can be very sort of um, simply defined as saying this doesn't happen when there's inclusivity, right? We don't really have to talk about what the problem is. So in a nutshell, that's my confession and my discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else want to talk about these terms? Anjali, yeah. So what a great way to kick this off. I totally uh, agree and support with the previous answers. So what I like to think about, and Ruth touched on this, is that what we're talking about is, is equity, right? Whether we use inclusivity or diversity or, um, representation, um, if, it's, if it's not meaningful, if, if it's not a movement towards equity, whatever word we use doesn't matter. Um, you know, I identify as mixed race, South Asian, cis head, I'm disabled, um, and um, I'm upper class. And, um, and so there is, I am, I am, I have a lot of privilege though, and a lot of power. And so I think the starting point is realizing that we as writers very likely hold more privilege and power over some other group, right? No matter how many marginalizations we deal with, ch chances are good that there is some group that has less privilege and power than we do. So I think of the beginning, the first step of inclusivity and representation is acknowledging that we come from a place where there is an inherent risk in our writing. This is true even when we write about our own communities, right? There are plenty of books from our own communities that are problematic and how they write about their own communities, right? Unfortunately, this is the case. So I think it's coming from a place of acknowledging that our writing almost always has the potential to do harm even if we are writing about our own people. Um, and, and, and I think that helps us understand then the writing process and how we need to write and how we need to think about writing and, and what kind of writing we need to put out in the world. And then I think the second prong of this, uh, you know, aside from, from acknowledging that we have privilege and power is interrogating our internalized biases in our own writing. Um, and then the third prong for me is, is the economic prong, is understanding that um, we as writers have a duty to uplift, amplify, and purchase the books of, of, uh, of other more marginalized books, uh, more marginalized authors. Um, it is a very proactive process. It's not just a, it's it's not just about sitting down and writing a story about something that interests us, right? It's a story. It's sitting down and really contending with our potential to do harm while we are writing stories. Yeah, that's so important. Valerie, were you going to say something? Yeah, I will add one one pithy quote that I tend to trot out because it seems to summarize stuff in a way that is is useful for some folks. Uh, and it's Mary Robin at Kowal said that it's not about adding diversity for the sake of diversity. It is about subtracting homogeneity for the sake of realism. Yeah, that's... I want that. 
overall. Uh, <laughs> I want a banner uh, of that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah I agree, absolutely. That belongs yeah. on a t-shirt and a bumper sticker. I would definitely buy that. That's something I spend yeah. a lot of time when I'm reading, thinking about um, the secondary characters and how they oftentimes get added in as like, oh, here's the flavor, right? And no agency, no real story, but they're just there to add kind of a prop. And inclusion is not about props. It's not about just throwing some extra color into a story because that's going to satisfy someone. It's how are you building a real world that really represents a variety of experiences, but doing it with respect and trust. I think those are also two pieces that need to be in the, the writing process as well. A deep respect for the characters you're creating and the world that you're trying to respect or your world you're trying to portray and a trust for your, that you're building with your reader, that this is going to be a safe place to engage with, with these characters and with these experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Someone has asked for that quote, so I am sticking that in the chat, the Mary Robinette Cole, Cole, sorry, let's see, for the sake of realism. There we go. Um, yeah, exactly. So that, that brings us actually quite nicely to our next question was, um, let's, can we talk about moments where a book felt like it represented something important for each of us? Um, something that you've read where you felt like you were being seen and valued and where the authors got it right and where, you know, the character that you see yourself in is not just some sort of sidekick or, you know, the parent of the protagonist's best friend, right, or, or something like that, where they're just sort of removed from the main story. Does anybody have stuff they've read recently where they really felt like, wow, I was this author knows what they're, what they're writing about. I can jump in on that one. I have a bunch of folks and probably unsurprisingly. So again, I'm Cuban American. So I'm going to try out a bunch of people who are similar in background to me. Uh, Carlos Hernandez is a great series selling Gabby Break the Universe. Um, that's middle grade novels. DJ Older often has a lot of uh, Cuban American inspired characters in, in his fiction. So things like Shadow Shaper, The Book of Lost Saints, Have Resurrection Blues and other, other stuff in the series. Uh, Jose Pablo Iriate um, has a great story called Yuca and Dominoes that is amazing. And Adriana Cuevas has Cuba in my pocket that came out pretty recently. Uh, and then in terms of films, Vivo, that I was watching that and feeling so utterly seen that I was weeping. Um, and Canto is Colombian, so not Cuban American, but there is some cultural overlap there. And so a lot of elements of that were similar to the experiences that I have from being in Miami and being uh, around a lot of mix of Latin American cultures. And so things, you know, it, it's always, I, I talk to my mom about how like, sometimes I'm not sure which things in my background, my heritage are Cuban, which things are Cuban American, which things are Miami, <laughs> and which things are Miami Cuban or some variation thereof, because that, that is a thing that happens with diversity too, is that your background can create this sort of melange of a lot of different things that interact with each other in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. Would you be willing to put those authors' names in the chat for people? That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think we have like, we're all these Venn diagrams, right? Like for me, there's disability, and there's autism, and then there's, you know, I'm white, and then there's, you know, which is something that I'm not grimacing about because, oh, I'm white, but I, I you know, I think about, it's something that I think about all the time, right, when I'm writing, because I want to make sure that I'm checking myself all the time, that I'm not just, you know, writing from a, a point of view that is, um, you know, that has that sort of traditional white supremacist institutionalized kind of approach to things right who else has read something recently where they they really mm -hmm. felt i can leap yeah. in on this this is actually 2018 um and it just made me weep i mean i grew up reading books and trying to find girls with crazy crazy hair because that was sort of my defining physical feature as a child um and i was given like sweet valley high those are <laughs> blonde twins i was like this is fantasy right? Um, and so I find myself in books like Rania the Robber's Daughter or um, uh, 
uh, Jacob have I loved because she has she's described as having really wild hair and that never really felt like enough that was such a weird tenuous one little feature was not going to make the person but then Adiv Haram's Darius the Great is not okay came out in 2018 and it That's is an amazing book. such an amazing book and it's such a representation of a family that I could finally sort of read myself into but the part that really just I think kind of broke my heart a little bit as a reader and then rebuilt it at the same time was the inclusion of one word and it was Kodafis which is the goodbye that Darius uses with his family. And that's what my, I've always grown up hearing my mother use that on the phone with her sisters, but I'd never seen that in text before. And just to see that on the page was such an incredible and meaningful moment. And the sequel has come out and I haven't even read the sequel yet because I'm a little, <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I trust <laughs> that the sequel will be a beautiful, but I have not actually read it yet. Just because I keep holding that moment of that, of just seeing that word on the page and how meaningful that was for me. Ruth, I know that you have at least talked a lot. I don't know how much you've written about representation of Muslims in literature and particularly Muslim women. I wonder if you would be willing to talk to us a little bit about that and what, what books you have found that get things right, but yeah. also, you know, sort of who hasn't gotten things right. Right. Well, you know, uh, uh, again, I, I kind of like to, to stay with journalism a little bit because, you know, that's kind of what I know best and have studied the most. But I would start by saying, you know, when we're talking about being white, that, you know, for me, representation, you know, is kind of close. And, and other than that, you know, I mean, so I have, I'm white, I've got the privilege, you know, all of that. So it's kind of difficult to talk about because I'm sort of talking about other people. But, you know, what we tend to see in media coverage and actually also in society, um, when ignorant people are speaking about Muslims is just stereotypes and tropes. And a lot of the time it's, it has to do with appearance, you know, I've noticed, for example, that when there's a sympathetic character um, that, or a sympathetic person, if it's a woman, she's showing some hair with her scarf. The woman who's covering all her hair is like, you know, a little bit more extreme, stuff like that. So a man with a beard or even, you know, a man of color with a beard, you know, like there's that stereotype goes on there as well. So it's sort of that dichotomy. And in the midst of all that, there's not really um, like, I was going to say an authentic Muslim voice, but there's voices, you know, that's one of the mistakes is to say, well, this is what a Muslim is like. You know, and actually that's the root of the whole problem is that um, Muslims are a lot of things and race totally plays into it because the majority of Muslims in this country are black and brown, you know, from, um, yeah, not, not like me. <laughs> so, um, and I keep repeating that because I want to make that clear that like, I'm not trying to come from a place other than, you know, the, the place of of privilege that I have. Um, yeah, and I think I know, that's, that's that. yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that I, I know that um, when I was growing up, people would see pictures of Queen Noor mm -hmm. and they'd be like, she can't possibly be Muslim. She's, she's blonde. Right, you know? right. And I'd be like, yeah. But, sorry. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, absolutely. It's, yeah, it's that expectation of appearance, I think, you know, which, which can be for good or ill, I guess, if, if you understand what it is that you're looking at. But um, yeah, so that, that sort of very clear dichotomy in the stereotypes, I think is, is where it goes wrong. So. Yeah. Does anybody else, Aral? Yeah, yes, Kendra, I actually wanted to answer your previous question about a book where I felt seen. Um, yeah. It's a book called Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, it's, she's Nigerian, obviously. Um, I'm Ugandan uh, from East Africa, but I felt seen in this book because, um, you know, it's taking place, it's taking place in three different countries, um, three different continents. 
And it very much mirrored what my life is, you know, moving, going to East Africa, going to Uganda, living here in the US, also going to Europe where I have family, going to Germany. So I just felt seen and just this explosion of African literature in the US and people actually knowing where countries are because once upon a time in high school, when I say I'm from Uganda, people thought it was in the Caribbean or they would say, what is that? Where is that? And um, you know, my parents were mortified. I was shocked because I knew everything about the US before I came to the US. I knew about the Montana, I knew everything, you know? So it, it was quite um, shocking to me when people didn't even know where my country was or where it was located. And so my teacher had to pull me aside and say, geography in the US is unfortunately, um, <laughs> you know, uh, um, you know, and it was, it was hard. It was, it, was, it was really hard when you know so much about the community you're coming into and your community knows nothing about you. Um, so this book helped, uh, I, I felt made me feel seen um, as an African, as an immigrant, as an African immigrant woman, as an eldest immigrant daughter, you know, all those different layers and that Venn diagram that you're talking about earlier, Kendra. Um, and also touching on immigration, dislocation, displacement, um, rootlessness, um, this idea of figuring out where home is and kind of always looking towards home or trying to figure out where home is, which I still um, struggle with in my own life, grappling with identity and negotiating, you know, where is home? Okay, I bought a house in the US, but I still don't feel like home, you know, where is home? So um, this book really made me feel seen as well as other writers, um, African writers, and also just immigrant writing in general. I mentioned earlier that I read a lot of um, Indian writers because that was what was there at first. Um, that was an explosion of um, in Indian immigrant writing, which I was like, oh, they're talking about all these things. They, they go through what Africans go through as well, you know? So um, it's really nice to see all of this happening and people will actually ask me, where are you from? And I'm, and they'll say, I know it's not Ghana or Nigeria. And I get so excited, you know? So um, this, this book was really influential as well as other books. Um, but as far as just seeing all the explosion of immigrant writing as well as immigrant writers writing memoirs and trying to figure out um, their place in the US or their place in North America while still um, keeping in contact with home uh, and being, um, you know, moving back between home and the diaspora is, is just, um, it's really important to see those stories. And I'm just really glad those stories exist. Thank you. Yeah, I think there has been, I mean, I've noticed this with, with publishing, right? That it's, there is this explosion of African writers that we can now read easily in the US, right? You know, um, and like you said, you know, for a long time, that wasn't the case. You know, if you were looking for immigrant writing experiences, you had to look to other places. Uh, Anjali, you were gonna say something, but I also wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit too about, um, how we recognize biases in our writing um, and how we, we start to correct those. Oh, I love that. Um, so first I wanna give a shout out to uh, a picture book, Lakshmi's Mooch by Shelley Anand, which is about body hair, specifically mustaches on girls and femmes. Um, and, um, you know, I'm in my late 40s and was so excited to read this picture book because when I was growing up, most of the books about body image were from a white perspective. Um, and, um, and I could not relate to body image issues as a young person when they were told from characters who were white and who were otherwise dealing with otherwise sort of accepted in society and not othered for skin color. Um, Skunk Girl by Sheba Kareem was a, is, a, is a young adult book that also dealt with, um, with body image and body hair. Um, so this was, these were two books that I was not able, I did not have access to, they did not exist until I was an adult. And they were books that I 
wished that existed. Um, so to answer your question, Kendra, so, um, you know, it takes a village. It takes being immersed in a multi-diverse community as a writer to begin to interrogate these issues. Um, for example, um, uh, working with beta readers who have a critical lens and an understanding of of social justice issues, to be quite honest. Um, you want a reader who is actively going to uh, point out your biases. Um, I have worked in the past with authenticity editors, which are professionals, and this is what they do. They interrogate your language, they interrogate your plot, they interrogate the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the style of the writing your character development. Um, they're gonna look for things like saviorism. Um, they're gonna look for things like the sort of magical Negro, magical native character, the, the disabled character that is portrayed as evil, um, you know, which is such a common trope um, uh, with respect to stories with disabled characters. Um, they're gonna highlight these for you. Um, I've had wonderful authenticity editors who then make suggestions. Um, you know, um, they're gonna say, you, you know, you don't use slave, do you use enslaved people, right? Um, so, so we need to understand that we have to be actively working in a community of people that have critical lenses because it's inter, Interrogating your your own internalized biases is not something that we can do as individuals, right? We are too entrenched in the culture that has raised us in these harmful perspectives. So we need to seek out help from others. We need to seek out professionals. We also need to understand that language changes over time and what was not considered harmful a year ago is harmful today, right? That requires us as writers to be flexible. Um, it requires us to realize that communities are not a monolith. Somebody, sorry, on this panel touched on this earlier. So I'm just repeating um, another person's idea, but communities are not a monolith, um, uh, which means that some folks pre uh, prefer indigenous, some folks prefer Indian, some folks prefer to be named by their particular tribe. Um, and those of us who are not in those communities don't get to decide, we don't get to make the judgment call. We also don't get to correct people. Um, you know, some folks prefer Latin X. It's, it's not my job to, to assume that that is what all folks of that background prefer. Um, and, and so um, we need to be understanding that this is a process that is constantly evolving. And so we have to be a part of communities um, that are open to changing, that are open to understanding that every day, our job as a writer is every day to get better, to be better and more open and aware and less harmful than we were yesterday. Um, and that means we need to be in communities. Um, uh, the class I taught recently was about writing with a social justice lens. Um, it's really hard to do writing that is inclusive and not harmful if you don't believe in basic social justice tenets in the real world. Um, you know, it's based, it, it's, it's gonna be really hard for you to not write classist writing if you don't believe that student loans should be forgiven. That's just one example, right? Um, so we have to understand that not only are we engaging in these communities as writers, outside of our writing, we need to be embracing um, inclusive ideas, representative ideas, diversity. We need to understand that we need to advocate as human beings to reduce harm in society. Because if we are not working within our communities, um, in some sort of um, uh, realm of activism, then our, it's not gonna translate to our writing very well, right? We can't just sort of understand these issues just in the text of our work. It has to be part of a global understanding of ways that we need to make society better and do less harm as individuals. This brings up a really good point and talking about language and the kind of language you use. And I want Valerie, if you'll talk to us a little bit about language and code switching when we're writing, what code switching is for those of us in our audience who aren't familiar with it, 
and how we can use that in our writing to um, to break down stereotypes, you know, um, and to provide a kind of authenticity for our characters. Yeah, and I'm not going to be giving a textbook definition of code uh, code switching. So if someone else has a better one, please feel free to jump in or um, post a link or something. But code switching essentially evolves to the the pattern of behaviors where you are going to have different sort of facades and different modes of speech and dress and and. Uh, just behaviors when you are with different groups. And so, for example, uh, code switching, if I'm speaking to, in, in, in a non sort of diverse sense, just everybody code switches. If, if you're talking to your boss, you're going to probably talk differently to your boss than you're going to talk to your friends. And you're probably going to talk differently to certain friends than you are going to talk to other friends. You're going to talk differently to your parent, your, your kids' teachers at school than you are going to talk to your mom. And so, just code switching involves just the, the behaviors of changing kind of who you are slightly to accommodate different. Uh, different social situations. Um, and in terms of diversity code switching, what it often means is that when um, especially non-white people are uh, with each other, then there can be a different sort of behavior, a different, a different uh, pattern of speech and so on. If you're with your own culture versus with if you're with people who at least have kind of a shared experience with you in some way versus if you are with a group of people who you, you can't trust necessarily because you don't know where they're coming from. And so you have to put put up those sort of facades. You have to put up those walls in order to protect yourself typically because you don't want to end up at the wrong end of some sort of, you know, uh, microaggressions at a minimum or actual active aggressions at, at in a worst case. And so when you're writing about characters, you have to take into account the kinds of code switching that any sort of marginalized person is going to be engaging in potentially at any given time. And that should be reflected in your writing, basically, depending on the situations that you're putting your characters in. I'm sorry, I'm gesturing and my cat wants to be petted. She's putting her face in my hands as I'm moving them. Um, so it's basically just knowing that even, even as you're writing these characters and you're trying to write them authentically, part of that authenticity is if you are writing a world in which code switching is going to be necessary in certain ways, you have to be aware of what those ways are, how those different characters are going to interface with different people and why, and working that into the writing that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, it's just, it's, it's so important. And I think sometimes we don't even realize when we're reading a book, where our characters or where other people's characters, you know, are code switching and things like this. One of the things that's that's interested been interesting to me in reading a lot of authors from different diasporas who are writing about life in the US but are, are writing diaspora fiction is how and when their characters use different languages other than English, right? And what it means for when they're dropping dropping words in and and, and things like that. Does anyone want to comment on that? Because I know that that's something we probably all have seen. We have all thought about doing in our writing, um, you know, using another language or using specialist terminology and things like that. A real quick note that yes, I absolutely have um, in in my novels because they are space opera. They take place in the future. What I opted to do was have communication devices that would basically just translate actively. But because the main character is essentially Cuban background uh, going into the future, she does throw a lot of Spanish into what she is saying uh, because Spanglish is a thing. It is it is a way that we talk. I mean, it's uh, and so because of that, I have her speak in Spanglish or I have her speak in Spanish when she's speaking to her mom, and that is all represented in the book. And because she is the POV character, I just put the Spanish in. And people sometimes are upset by that. They are like, I have to go look a thing up. Oh, no. And I'm like, yeah, it happens in Joyce, too. Sorry. But like, it, it, it's something <laughs> it, It's something that I, I at first was really worried and, and freaked out about. But I got less apologetic about over time. And at this point, I'm just kind of like, yeah, I mean, look it up or don't. It's it's You can still read the rest of the book. It's less than 1% Spanish. I think you'll be OK. Tanya, you have done a lot of writing in speculative fiction. Um, you know, do you want to add on to what it's like writing in ways that are inclusive and, and have representation in settings that are not our immediate real world? 
I, yeah, I, um, I love that speculative fiction opens up so many different avenues, but that does not mean that it's utopias, right? It doesn't mean that you get to flatten just because you're writing in a world that has magic or that has space travel or that has dragons, right? Just because you're adding these other elements in, that's not an opportunity to flatten or forget the fact that whatever world is still populated by people and people make terrible choices and set out horrible rules for each other. So having to grapple with that doesn't change based on the setting. It just means that you get to deal with it in slightly different ways. You get to choose different kinds of metaphors and you get to choose different kinds of settings and conflicts that will then explore whatever themes you are working on, whatever kinds of representation or kinds of stories you are choosing to tell. Um, and for me, that's been something that's been really powerful and been really helpful that I can take some of my experiences in our known world and write them into a different setting and use different kinds of metaphors to deal with things that I am still trying to figure out how to deal with in my current setting <laughs> by putting it into space or by putting it into a made up landscape or by putting, you know, various different kinds of social issues that I have to deal with or that I see peers struggling with means that I can deal with those in different ways and find different avenues for solving those issues for maybe not solving is not really the right word, but <laughs> but for addressing or finding a different kind of power and strength in those interactions. Um, and I think there's, I mean, there's so many fantastic stories and there's so many different ways of seeing the way that speculative fiction can handle really difficult and really just in some ways, just horrifying um, world events or, or truths about our world and putting them into different settings that in some ways makes the reader and the character feel a little bit more empowered through that storyline itself. So we have a question and we're open for questions. So stick your questions in the question box or the chat. Lisa says, language evolves over time. Example, in the 60s and 70s, Black was considered more respectful in the 80s and 90s, African-American was considered more respectful. In the early 2000s, people of color was considered respectful. Now, black and brown is considered more respectful. How do we ensure that the language we use in our literature will still be inclusive into the future? So do you wanna take that on? I'll happily talk about it a little bit. You know, there was this really great uh, conversation on Twitter recently where, um, where some folks suggested that they didn't like black and brown. Um, and, and, you know, this is a perfect, it's a great, great question. We can never actually be 100% that we're using the right language. And what we need to do is be comfortable with that. Um, so um, some people uh, do not like the, the term BIPOC, right? Black, indigenous, people of color. Um, many people do not like the term uh, POC. Um, I feel comfortable using black and brown, but um, uh, what do we do with folks who identify as, as who are white presenting, but are called brown, right? Uh, in South Asia, for example, there are some very light skinned folks um, who do not necessarily uh, identify as brown people, but they're from a part of the world that is considered brown. So that term doesn't work for them. Folks who are indigenous don't necessarily feel comfortable with the term brown. Um, so we have, to, we have to be a part of communities with multiple points of view and understand that we are not necessarily going to get it right. Um, the term minority is not really used very much anymore. It is a term that I love, actually. It's a term that I disparaged and hated when I was growing up because it was used in such a derogatory way. And I personally have come to reclaim that term. Um, and and that, that, is, that may be offensive to other black and brown folks that I have reclaimed this term. So we just have to understand that we're not ever going to always get it right and sit with that discomfort and strive to learn and understand and be a student forever on, on terms and when they are used. Um, 
and and really unpack what it means to to use language to not take it for granted that we are correct that we are the authority on language and how it's used and that again communities are not monoliths yeah i mean i just, i think it's super important i was also thinking about how when i was growing up queer was a slur right queer was something that you did not call somebody that right and now the queer community we've reclaimed the word queer we've we are holding on to that right that's ours now so i can say i am queer right it's the same thing for a lot of disabled writers where you know people you know 100 years ago we would have been called cripples in some cases right and now there's cripplet hashtag cripplet which is where disabled people you know we have taken that word back and we're like yeah we're crips and here's how we're writing about it and here's what we're writing and here's who we are and we refuse to be shamed by this word so we're taking it back you know for ourselves we have another question here marie writes what about gender pronouns um we write a book mentioning the word he as the perpetrator most of the time but write a disclaimer saying this is just a word based on statistics but it is parenthetically unfortunately parenthetic interchangeable somebody want to talk about that here's one where you know language is flexible and language does change and um as someone with some linguistics background i try to be descriptive rather than prescriptive i am not ever going to tell someone that they can't use a particular word right I and mean, that is not that's not what's interesting to me about language um i think that you know if if you're writing about um the perpetrators of something that has happened and it's 90 percent male identifying people you might say he right but i think more and more people have gotten comfortable with the plural they and some of us use or the singular they and some of us you know, i mean that's been in use for 400 years it's not a new thing right um you know there there will be people who complain you know conservative writers will complain you know people who don't really understand grammar or the history of language will complain um but it's becoming it's so so accepted at this point that we could replace he with they you know in many cases probably right we can put replace she with they um so you know that's just that's something where i think that we look at what the current language trends are and we try to take what's good what's socially right what's socially just in those linguistic trends and we and we use that you know um it's it's you know and we also have to to realize that language does change and the things we write today you know may seem terribly offensive or dated 50 years from now it's like when, it's like when people write novels and they put in monetary amounts for things they put in like the dollar amount for something like they're really shocked that gas is a dollar 22 and i'm like okay you're you're writing this during the carter administration right right now if it's a historical novel they're writing it today and they're looking back and, and doing that you know great people were shocked right if it's a book that was written then and everybody is just outraged right you know it it may seem you know kind of like wow that was a long time ago you know people realize that, that things change you know I, you know and someone says my rent was six hundred dollars i'm like yeah it was the 90s right <laughs> or whatever depending on where you are right so language and these references change and we just have to to know that you know our writing will be out there hopefully forever or for a very long time and people will just have to to look at some of it and say okay so this is not how we would write about this today you know that's not to say that i want to take every book out there that has racist language in it and say oh everyone should still read all of this because no because a lot of it is really racist you know um or sexist or you know bigoted in other ways um but but yeah we we do i think i think we have a responsibility to write about things in the best way possible right like anjali was saying you know it's 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 the kind of advocacy right the way we write the act of writing is advocacy the fact that we are just writing is is advocacy and um we are contributing to the body of work 
that is more socially just and that, that works for social justice. Other questions? Oh, here's another question. Nope, you already may answered I, that question. Oops, yeah. Sorry. May I, answer, may I answer Lisa's question? It was the question yeah. about language evolving over time. Um, um, I, I, as someone in the US, I'm labeled as black. Um, and however, I've noticed um, whether it's on the census or whether it's on uh, different applications when I apply for fellowships or whatever, um, it doesn't only just say black and African-American, um, it, it now to include all the different, the diversity of the black community in the US, it will say black, Caribbean, African, Afro-Latino, like it, you know, and, um, I started, I've noticed that applications do that and I didn't realize how I didn't feel seen before when I could actually like put the box and say African and actually put Ugandan or put my tribe or my, my group and say Lango. Um, so I, and that's only happened in the past two years, no, three years. And I didn't realize that. And I've been here since high school and I moved back and forth between Uganda and here. And so when someone asks me, what is ethnicity? Ethnicity in the US usually means your race, your, you know, <laughs> um, are you African-American? Are you white? Are you uh, Iranian? But ethnicity in my country is about language. You know, it's tied to what language you speak, um, not necessarily your race. Um, and also talking with uh, different black communities here in the US, when someone says black, typically they mean black American. They don't mean black immigrants. They don't mean Af Afro Latinos or Caribbean or, you know, so it was just very um, feeling like you're not seen even though you're contributing to this country and this culture. I mean, there's, there's a, you know, any city you go to, there's an African uh, immigrant restaurant somewhere, you know, so, um, just, I think answering Lisa's question about language evolving over time, I think just kind of consulting and just asking questions. Because what I've noticed, you know, different communities, wherever I am, if I show that I'm interested in someone's culture, they will help me. They will guide me. They will teach me um, how to pronounce their names and how to, um, you know, how they want to be called. And I think that's so important. So if I go, uh, for example, I have African-American friends who some love to be called African-American and some want to be called Black American because they feel like they have no recent connection to the African continent. And, that, and that's okay. And I respect that. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm, I'll gladly say, yes, I'm Black, but I have more layers than um, my race. I am African, I come from this specific country called Uganda, and I speak this specific language. Um, and that is very important um, for me. Um, my culture um, is very important uh, for me. So in the past few years, just to be able to fill out a form, any form, uh, whether it's a workshop form and actually see, you know, African and they ask what a, a tribe, I'm like, oh my God, you know? <laughs> uh, and so one of my Native American friends was telling me, she said, um, you know, they had to fight for a long time to have that distinction on a form for indigenous people in this country. Um, so just, just having that visibility and being seen. Um, but I, I really, Lisa's question, uh, I don't know, made my antennas go up because um, it, it really, you know, I like to know what people want to be called and whatever it is you want to be called, um, your names, you know, like someone said earlier, I think it was uh, Valerie, you know, uh, I'm sorry, Anjali um, said, you know, some people want to be called Indian if they're um, indigenous to this country. And some people want to be called Native American. It really depends on, on what people want to be called. So thank you for that question, Lisa. Um, and I think Holly just gave us a warning. Yeah, she did. <laughs> So I want to thank everyone uh, for this great session. Please continue to have these conversations. They are so important and continue to ask people um, things. We have one question in the chat, but I'm going to, and that's from Rachel. Rachel, I'm going to ask if you'll put that in the Discord since we need to shut down right now. 
um, and, and move to the next session. We're also having a break section next. I think I will be there. I am helping host that. Um, and we can continue to talk about these things there. Again, I want to thank all the panelists. You are just tremendous. Thank you so much for doing this. And uh, I will see you at other events today. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, Kendra.